Kia ora koutou. Um, ko whaka kunsh toku i noa, and it's a great pleasure to, um, to introduce our panel to you. I think most of them are well known, and um, as we go through the discussion, um, I hope that the one or other that has not spoken to you before will introduce themselves just a little so that um, we provide context. We felt that it might be a great idea to go right into it and not um, have presentations or anything, but also provide the opportunity to you all to, um, to ask questions. I can imagine that there must be many. Have you ever heard of such an amazing opportunity? Here we are with a thousand different species of seaweed. And there we are with a million possible applications, ranging from environmental benefits all the way through I don't know, multiple opportunities to produce food out of seaweed. And when you then look again at this thousand species, we are currently talking maybe about, I don't know, 10 or so, and already we understand what the potential is. And then you hear of challenges. It takes time to actually get somewhere. But then again, you hear of some that say, ah, 12 months. So, I'm really curious to understand exactly what the, tr the truth is. Um, the, other, <laughs> the other challenges, um, you hear a lot about, well, the volume that is involved in order to bring something to fruition here. We heard about um, 500 um, tanks produce or produce enough asparagopsis or, yeah, asparagopsis for some 50,000 cows, which means we need something like 85,000 tanks in order to cover 8 million cows in New Zealand alone. So we'll have a lot of those tanks and maybe another opportunity is to rather reduce the cows and <laughs> provide sort of a, a balanced <laughs> approach. <laughs> I say that because we don't have any farmers in the room. <laughs> no, but um, I think there, are, there is tremendous opportunity, but there are also many questions. And um, when you take this approach and you end up there, you realize very quickly that coming from opportunity, there's signs, and then there seems to be a very thin line that creates a huge bottleneck, and then it opens up again, there's signs, knowing about potential outcomes, and then all that opportunity. It's these bottlenecks that I would like to understand in a little bit more detail. Um, Haley, I start with you, because you've built a seaweed business, that, that's actually the first one that I come about, Pacific, Pacific Harvest, um, which d doesn't really farm seaweed, but you utilize it, and you've seen the opportunity with seaweed. Now that um, you've been in it for quite a while, and you've heard about all these challenges, but you also know what you faced, would you do it again? Yeah, I mean, Pacific Harvest is a 20-year-old business, um, but we bought it three years ago, so I'm a relative newcomer to the seaweed space and still absolutely... I'm discovering new things every day that I, questions that I never even asked before. So it's a huge topic and it will keep evolving as we learn more. Um, I definitely think it solves so many problems in the world, whether it be, uh, or one of our mission, our mission is to make it easy to eat a little seaweed every day because it's so good for the planet and it's so good for us. And um, the good news is the nutrient density is so high, you don't need a lot to really make a difference to human health. So absolutely would do it again. I mean, the opportunity is huge that solving the planet problems, human health problems, it's one of the most exciting opportunities we have. But you're dependent on wild supplies, aren't you? No, we work, no. We, so we have nine species of seaweeds, um, some we import and increasingly, our, well, I thought when I bought it, that we would only be working with New Zealand um, harvesters, but I quickly realised there's not enough supply. So um, our model has been really to build the channel, build the channel to market, and then show that there is opportunity and build local supply as that becomes available. I'm very pleased to have found a small group of harvesters who operate at a really high um, quality level locally, and we're looking to develop that more. But in the meantime, we are still importing species, some of which actually grow here, um, but for many reasons we are not able to access. So I think um, days like today 
give people opportunity to connect and find I'm finding out what pe different people are into and we can start those conversations. So really appreciate um, everyone who's pulled this together to facilitate that. Yeah, thank you, Haley. Blair, um, you are sort of about to enter into the industry. Um, what convinced you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Blair Wolfgram. Uh, Volker asked me to introduce myself because uh, a lot of people might not know me. I'm the managing director of Ocean Beach. Um, we are a land-based aquaculture park at the start of State Highway 1 in Bluff. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we've got 50 hectares there. We uh, 45 buildings. It's the old Ocean Beach Meatworks there, which had a lot of uh, seawater infrastructure from the Meatworks that was there. Um, we're farming power there, and that's what drove me to seaweed. We need seaweed for the power initially, and I was just really surprised at um, how fragmented things were, and um, it was really hard to get any information on trying to source product. And, um, and yeah, that, and I just, the more I understood about seaweed, um, you know, I've, I've um, I didn't. I didn't understand a hell of a lot, to be honest, and um, I've just been fascinated and 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 amazed by um, what what wonderful attributes it, it does for our environment, our ecosystem. And now, when I go snorkeling, I I just hate kinna. I just uh, <laughs> have this. Uh, I, I I never. I, I I love eating them now. I eat lots of them. So, um, but yeah, little things like that that I, I was really naive to, and I've, I've really enjoyed it. And the people, like it's. It's, um, I've, I've been fortunate to work in a number of industries in my uh, long life, um, and it's, uh, it's just, a, they're just a great group of people and, 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 a, and a wonderful mix. So, yeah. What yeah. stage are you at on your CV journey? So we sort of see ourselves as an enabler, so obviously Nigel and the, the amazing work the CH4 team are doing, um, we, we're enabling them to do what they do, okay. basically. Um, we are in aquaculture through the power farm, um, but we've also got Manaki whitebait. We're doing the first whitebait harvest in January there, which is really, really exciting. Um, and yeah, so we, we're an enabler. We, we try and um, make the, it's a very expensive process um, doing aquaculture, um, and, and it tends to be dominated by the big corporates. Um, so, so we're trying to enable people to get in at a lower cost mm -hmm. and um, have a crack, you know. Okay. Um, yeah. We yeah. like to um, be involved in the most difficult species. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> but, um, so yeah. In, in, in terms of that, and it's very um, cash intensive, I would think, working capital intensive. Um, do you deal with BNZ? Yes, we have an amazing bank. All right, well, yeah. so. yes. <laughs> No, we don't. The, we're, it's, it is. It has been a difficult asset to bank, is what I would say. Um, an old contaminated meat works at the bottom, the start of New Zealand. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. BNZ have, have been great. Um, they have um, taken on probably more risk than um, they would typically do. Um, mm. And yeah, we've got a great. All, all of our investors are friends and family, and we're just starting to bring more local investment in as well. Um, and yeah, that it. It's, it's a staged process in terms of that, mm -hmm. and as you de-risk, you're able to access more capital, and as well as um, doing what you say you're going to do, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, Let's hand over to Jason. Um, Jason. Thanks, Blair, the check's on the mail. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I hope for the industry association as well. Sure, um, so. <laughs> if you, if you um, hear about all this opportunity, mm. but also the challenges that we face and the longevity in some cases mm. that it actually takes to get something going. Uh, how does a bank like BNZ stand to providing capital to get a group of people to invest straight away and build a fantastic seaweed farm? Sure. I mean, I think we take a long-term approach, and I think, um, as my colleague mentioned earlier yeah. this morning, Alex, if you look at it from a kind of a sustainability lens, um, the industry itself has enormous potential, both for as, as a food source and as Nigel mentioned a little bit earlier, in terms of reducing bovine emissions. So in terms of ESG, sustainability, where all businesses are going and certainly all funding institutions are going, they're much more likely to be involved with those industries in the future. Um, so they're actually in a better position than many industries. Um, and if you think of a new industry, so if we want to sort of wean ourselves off um, daring or one or two other industries and have a look at something that's new, um, that's scalable, that's addressing real-world problems like reducing 
carbon emission, um, in, improving flavors of food. Um, the Asian cuisine has been using, you know, um, wakame or kombu for centuries. Uh, so there's all those applications from both a food consumption perspective and a, and a, and a climate perspective. Um, it ticks all the right boxes for an industry you should be investing in. Um, certainly, absolutely, um, there are some challenges associated with giving it to a new industry, um, time to get off the ground. There are some regulatory challenges that we've heard about today, but I don't think that's a reason not to be involving in the industry. Um, our view is we take a kind of a long-term view of funding that industry because it's where it is now, but when in 5, 10, 15 years' time, uh, where might it be? If you have a look at other industries, when the wine industry started in the late 60s or early 70s, people were asking the same question. So I don't think that's any inhibitor to get in the industry. We're just basically at this stage learning all we can, like coming to events like today, connecting with the community, understanding more about the industry so we can better support it. Okay. So, um, Matt, if you, um, if you look at the regulatory framework that's here, um, that sounds like an, a bottleneck on the journey from opportunity to outcome. Um, how can we enable a quicker process here? How can we ensure that New Zealand understands that this is the opportunity of a lifetime that can get our country into a climate positive state, possibly within a generation? We have nine years, we heard earlier, um, and the way things are going, we've been talking about some for much longer than, than that, um, and it just feels like stifled right now. Okay, uh, kia ora, uh, kia ora everyone, uh, ko mātou tokoingoa, nō tītou i hua hau. Um, I'm, I'm Matt, I'm here, I'm here from the top of the south, I was born in Blenheim, both my kids are born here in Nelson, but now I apply my trade in, in Nations Capital. Um, and just, uh, just sorry, I missed this morning, and I'm really sorry for that, because I would have jumped in and, and answered these questions at that time, but I was with my bank, the Treasury, and uh, <laughs> we take those meetings <laughs> when they need them. Um, look, so just Falker, you said you know, it feels, it looks, it, let's be honest, it is. It is a bottleneck, it is not working. Um, we know that and we understand it, but I think it's really important to go that it's not by design. So um, I, I constantly have to remind my team and my colleagues and my people that the law we're working with wasn't quickly written in the 90s when it came into place. It was designed in a time and a place where there were important things in mind right there. So. Uh, when the Fisheries Act provisions around this were put in place, they weren't thinking about a future uh, where we had a climate crisis. They weren't thinking about a future where seaweed would be something you can turn into so these amazing products. Um, where I sit is about sort of understanding and working out how to knock down those barriers. Um, and there are two things we are um, doing. Um, the first one is um, a special permit purpose that enables the collection from the wild to establish the broodstock. So at the moment that's just not allowed. Um, we're going to get that, in well we're going to go to the community with a proposal on that and the plan is to get that in place. So all of a sudden um, initiating the aquaculture activity using the wild stock will come in place. Now that will need controls on it because the reason we don't allow that at the moment very easily is because we don't want to see rampant um, sort of uh, harvest from the wild stock. So we've got a way forward on that. And the reason we're focusing on that is because that's in our control. So when you work in government, different decisions go at different levels. And I know that law reform is something that a lot of people would like. Um, these regulations in the Fisheries Act. So uh, last Thursday, um, big reforms of the Fisheries Act. Uh, the last time there were big reforms of the Fisheries Act, 1990s. So the opportunities to make those legal reforms do not come around easily. So we're going to focus on the things we can do. So the first thing is that special permit purpose. Um, the second one is just that there's a, rig, um, a, a schedule in the Act which lists a, a bunch of species that you can't farm. So we know Eclonia is on that, right? Again, we need to remember it's on there for a reason. It wasn't someone went, let's put some seaweeds in here that you can't farm. At that time, there were people that were very concerned about what might happen. So we're, we're looking to remove those species from that list. Again, we have to go to the public and, and talk that through. And it will be about the, the, the controls we put on place on the other side to make sure that those risks that they were trying to manage are taken out. So those two things should streamline your ability to initiate your business um, with, uh, with our, our wild resources, the starting point to enter into farming. My, if I can just go, the, the next thing I know, the RMA is really problematic. Um, my, my view there again is what can I control? Well, I can help councils with their decision making. I can help them go, you know, if you want to move from farming mussels to farming shellfish, we can provide the information, the resource that tells you it's a lesser environmental effect. Um, you know, provide, you know, de-risk the decision making they're taking. So um, the focus we'll have there in time will be about going, how do you um, take the existing water space that might have been consented for mussel farming, 
or consented for something else and make that transition into these other species simple because it's not about the species, it's about the effect. So you want to think about the effects envelope and you know, uh, it's not completely technically correct but the effects envelope of seaweed A and seaweed B and seaweed C will be very similar and almost certainly less than the effects envelope of maybe mussels. So that's where we're going with that. If there was one thing that you would advise us to do to help you get about change much quicker, what, what would that be? It would be to come to us early with what it is you're trying to achieve because um, generally we can, we can find a way to navigate the system and find a way to do it. So um, it's, it's quite common from where I sit to see people sort of, sort of try to present the case for the bigger change um, as opposed to sit down with us to work out how we might get, get through the system. Um, and th I, th I think that is the better way. Um, every time one of these things comes up, we've got people like Tony in the room, um, Paul before Tony, um, that they know these, these hurdles and these bottlenecks, but they can find a way. Um, I know there's another problem in the system around, you know, you have to be a fisher in, a, in, a, in an LFR. Um, that might sound like a big problem, but it's not really a big problem. There's just a really practical way into that without trying to just change the law. So the one thing I'd say is if you're going, this is what I want to do, we'll give you really practical advice on the way we think you can get there, um, as opposed to sort of trying to make the, that the case for broader change will become when this opportunity is so much closer to us and the change it can make for New Zealand is so much more real. So at the moment, um, I can certainly see it, right, but, but it is a little bit theory when it gets closer to us and these, these impediments really start impacting, then all of a sudden you don't need to make the case for change, it will happen. I guess that's what you did, Hayden, to have such plain sailing and get something over the line in 12 months. Congratulations, by the way. Um, I'm envious, to be honest. Um, for what you've achieved there, but on the other hand, I count on you being very collaborative and sharing what has actually led to that success so that we can all utilize that opportunity and that wisdom to yeah. create a great future for our Terra New Zealand. Well, I think, um, you know, we still have got to get a consent for the, for the 10,000, but um, doing land-based stuff is a lot easier, and actually it's a, it's a controlled environment, so um, it's a, like a, a smart step, and I think it's the big thing that we've done is actually we've gone and get, got some people who are going to lift and shift into our space and who want to come and help us. So that's why we did it quickly. I, I, we also, um, as some of the people in the room, um, are, are in the throes of designing a mussel spat hatchery up into Kaha as well. And, um, you know, we're going through a, a, an interesting process uh, around that. We've been researching for two years, as, as you know, Volker, and, um, and making good progress. But I think... Um, you know, I, I'm very new to the industry, as many of you know, um, and it's, I just describe it as a bit of a cottage industry, to be honest, um, which has its charm, but also has its challenges. But my advice is really simple. If you pitch at mediocrity, you might hit it. So go, you know, go loud, go proud. We're, there's a room full of really, really smart people. We'll find a way through and just, um, just dream big. We've got so much, I mean, New Zealand's, EZ is the ninth largest on the planet. I think I saw on the slide it's 15 times larger than, than the, than the um, uh, 15 times larger than our, than our land space. So that's where our future is. So we've just got to find our way carefully, but at, at reasonable pace and scale. We're good at doing pace in New Zealand. We're quite good at doing scale. We're shit out at doing pace and scale at once. <laughs> so um, we've got to find a way to get smarter at doing that. Um, while you're at it, um, talking about your insights there and having not only a room full of people but a country full of people that wants to achieve exactly that ambition, to what extent can we count on collaboration and trusted sharing here to actually bring that about? I think um, I, I th I, the, the simple answer to that is this, um, we should stop arguing amongst ourselves if I was going to have a crack at a phrase. The size of the prize is over the horizon, everybody. You know, we've got to find a way to, to work together in a way that we haven't historically, I suspect. If I hear what I hear, I mean, I've got no baggage, I don't have any history here. But if we st stop that and really focus on the horizon, because there's big products out there, sorry, there's big markets out there, there's lots of opportunity with products, and we've just tapped into one really quickly. Um, 
And, you know, we would love to help people do that. And I just think if we can find a way to do that in a, in a smart way, and I think the association's a really good start, which is why I've, um, you know, put my little hand up to help where I can, um, then we can do this. But as I say, the size of the prize is over the horizon. And Claire, thank you very much for leading the way. Um, I don't think I've ever seen in all the countries I've lived in an association come together this quickly. But it always comes down to one thing, and that's a person that takes the initiative. Um, and that's on, on everything. Um, my analogy is always everybody in a company wants to do those Friday afternoon drinks, but it takes one person to actually just take the initiative and make it happen. Otherwise, everybody just keeps talking about it. Um, so thank you and um, congratulations for having the first um, AGM coming up in, in about half an hour. Um, you've got a very um, interesting um, business going that is, was probably the second one that I came about back in my days at Sanford um, because you've got this, what we should really be proud of, this sustainable, um, indigenous, um, the story of New Zealand, valuable um, model going. Um, but then you see, on the other hand, that we are also in a seaweed environment internationally. Tens of millions of tons that are farmed, uh, large, um, large swaths of it, um, and that's the danger that we might actually enter into that as well here in New Zealand. How do you feel about that? Where's the opportunity? Is it both? Yeah, f first of all, um, it's definitely not just me. Uh, I know, we have an Yeah, <laughs> 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 I'm really uncomfortable with you putting it on me <laughs> because there's an incredible team of people yes. um, that, have, that have put their shoulder to the wheel Kia to ora. get this up and yeah. running. Um, and secondly, um, yeah, I, I guess f for me um, and where our family's values sits and, and how we see the future is around healthy ecosystems. So large, massive swathes of monoculture having learnt what I've learnt in the agricultural sector on land, that doesn't make sense mm. from a long-term intergenerational standpoint. Yeah, so that's how yeah. I feel about that. Yes, <laughs> and, and listening to, um, was it Brent that said this morning that the farmer usually sits at the lowest end, um, doesn't really earn anything, yeah. and, um, and we like to really produce from a primary production yeah. perspective and take care of that, and yeah. if there's nothing in it for us. And I think I even saw on um, Tanya's slide around Hatch looking at kind of largest volume, lowest cost, and I was just like, light bulbs, light bulbs, light bulbs. Like, actually, how can we create the maximum value yeah. at lowest volume? Um, and so that's where that whole biorefinery sort of situation is a, is a potential, um, but also recognising those uh, potential ecological benefits and valuing those. Yeah. Um, so we're starting to see, um, you know, it might be called ESG now, but, you know, from an Indigenous perspective, those things are, are always part of the business plan. Yeah. And so if we're looking at investment, you know, those th sorts of things need to be embedded mm. into how this sector rolls forward. Yeah. And when you then think about the task force for nature-related financial disclosure coming up and those criteria put forward, um, Jason, is that something that you consider in your application of um, loans to entities that apply? Is uh, absolutely. that commodity versus value-added thinking? Uh, yep, two, two questions there. Uh, the first one, absolutely. Um, and you'll find that moving forward, um, uh, not just banks, but other financial institutions, insurance companies, etc., are progressively moving down that path. So not only about the actual business that we work in, uh, what, what's our um, ethical background? You know, are we, you know, being true to our principles, but also going to the principle, going through all our customers, we'll be doing kind of quasi looking at their businesses, what are their sourcing strategy like um, in terms of the labour practices, where they're sourcing their raw materials from, what, produ what goods are they producing, are they solving a real uh, issue problems, etc. So that's, that's, that's already happening now, but it's going to get more progressive mm. each year that passes. So that's absolutely um, front of mind for all institutions in terms of supporting businesses moving forward. And that's where the, the whole position with um, uh, seaweed, it's, it starts from a very favourable position for both as, as a large scale volumes are talking about Niger before with CH4, if you're going to service you know, millions of cows across the world, you'll need large volumes to do so. So there was, that, there was a position for that, but there's also a position um, for the food consumption perspective and, and, and additives to food, make things more flavoursome, etc. Um, and I just interestingly on that, I was, my first involvement with um, seaweed actually, when I was based in a previous role when I was in Japan, we had some Japanese customers that we took down to the South Island actually, right down the bottom of the South Island, not far from where you are. Um, 
Blair. And they were very interested in actually the seaweed species that was here in New Zealand at the time, because it was not the same, but it was certainly comparable to what they were using in Japan, and it definitely had food applications. Um, but the challenge then was kind of timing. There was absolutely no infrastructure in place in New Zealand then, and you really couldn't expect one business to hold 100% of the risk and 100% of the cost, so it didn't actually progress from that stage. But I'm thinking, if that was to happen now, I think you'd probably find a more favourable position because we're establishing some sort of infrastructure in New Zealand. There's a group of um, like-minded people in the room here today. So I, I think we're in a good position to have that foundation to grow that business, both as a food consumption business and as a large um, you know, volumes in terms of servicing the, um, the feedstock or the dairy industry. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about um, establishing ourselves here, but not necessarily much about the market out there. So to what degree does that, is that being reflected on Hayden? Yeah, I just... I, I think the, there's a lot of, I mean, the, the, climatology, the climate issues are a significant one, obviously. Yeah. I, I learned a ditty when I was overseas. Um, this is, I'll just power up some stuff off. Um, the, the big scientists will tell you we need to, to grow um, about a billion tonnes of seaweed a year. Um, and extract the carbon and sequester the carbon if we're going to bend the curve, right? So you've got a billion tonnes. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's about 40 tonnes a hectare. And then you go, OK, that's 25 million hectares. And you go, what does that mean? Well, New Zealand's 23.8 million hectares, as it turns out. And you go, oh, so we need a seaweed farm about the same size of little old NZ. That uh, if we grew all the seaweed, then we could sequester all the carbon and then we'd sort of make the planet right. And then you think, actually, our, ET, our um, EEZ is 430 million hectares. So between, somewhere between 5 and 10% of our seawater space taken up as a, as a seaweed farm that grew all the carbon that we, all the seaweed and carbon extraction for the whole planet is not so silly anymore. So those are the kind of aspirational things that we can actually do. We've got the science for the carbon extraction, actually. In fact, I've just kicked off a project to put carbon powder into concrete with WSP to see, uh, to see what the strengths um, of the concrete is for non-structural. So these things are very real, guys, and if we've just got to get off our tail and go and do some, do some homework and then we can do something extraordinary, that's my sense. Yeah, you can. Um, yeah, so the carbon sequestration I learned earlier, that is quite something that is still, um, there are still a lot of question marks around that. Uh, yeah, there are, but the scientific papers are there and uh, the guys at, uh, in Mexico have cracked a couple of things too, so there you go. Yeah, no, I like that idea with concrete and um, maybe if yep. that is available, we'll build the new science and tech precinct <laughs> down by the port with yeah. some seaweed well, concrete. Well, guys, you know, yeah. uh, for those of you who do know my background, I, I, I used to look after the assets in Wellington City, so I'm, I'm actually a, I'm a, I'm an infrastructure guy, to be honest. So um, I just gave a mate of mine a call who knows about this stuff, and the, the rest is kind of history. So, but we, so Eisenhower put um, billions of um, cubic metres of concrete in America after the Second World War, and it's all coming up for renewal. The rest of the planet did something similar. We did something similar in New Zealand. It's, we have the, after the first full replacement cycle, after, after the baby boomers, and we put all that, all that stuff in the ground. So it seems quite timely, actually, given we're going to have to replace it all to put carbon in it and put it back in the ground yeah. again. So we, the, science is, the science is here, so we've just got to figure out yeah. how to do this. I just hate the thought of um, transporting all that concrete then to the US by a ship. <laughs> I, um, I, I would just send the carbon powder, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, Matt, you wanted to say um, what your preference is from a government perspective, whether it's commodity or added value. Yeah. large areas of one species versus... Yes, yeah, so the, the scale question one's an interesting one. So the, um, I don't think this is a controversial answer, but, but I, I want that to be the choice of the people that are um, taking this forward. And the, the reason, reason I say that, so I don't want it to become default because um, the framework means you can't go to a scale that might be necessary to deliver the thing you're trying to deliver on. And I'm just going to use a little example from when we, when we first met Nigel around um, CH4, right? Um, now, the numbers will be wrong, I have no doubt, but you sort of, back of the fig packet, you're sort of saying, if we were to farm this in the sea, we might need 12,000 hectares or 15,000 hectares. Now, that's a lot. That's a lot. Um, 
But if, if that is a viable um, thing to remove methane emissions from New Zealand, then maybe that's what might need to happen. Um, but in order for it to happen, and I'm going to borrow John Whittington's words from the other day, is to it has to happen in balance with nature, right? Mm. So, uh, like Hayden, I can go 15,000 hectares, that's not a lot when you look at the marine estate, but that's, that's not the point. The point is, is there, is there 15,000 hectares that is the most suitable place to do that? Mm. But we only answer that question when we know it is absolutely necessary to do that because that's what we need, need to do as a country. So um, I, I completely agree with Claire, actually. I love that kind of, let's if start our prospect on um, low volume, high value. That will actually help to build the social licence and the interest in the sector and the support to maybe do different things. But what I don't want to happen is the scale question be defined by the fact that um, the Resource Management Act or the decision makers or the things like that drives it that way. I want it to be a conscious choice of the sector. Mm. Um, do I want scale that's producing um, a product that is akin to milk powder or not? No, I don't. I want, uh, if scale is necessary to solve the environmental issue or to deliver the high value protein that is going to um, improve the diets of people and do those things, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I want us to have scale um, for the right reason. Um, last thing, and I'm, it, I, I tend to make up things based on little ideas I have, but as you mentioned about those people coming to New Zealand looking to bring those things, um, I kind of think with the sector we're not being driven by others coming to us wanting a product to bring home. I think we're very, yeah, every single thing I've seen today is about a product or a service or something that's intended for the future, but something we want. Um, and I think that's actually a really powerful starting point for the sector. Um, if you if, if people are here going, you've got a big EZ and we want you to do what we can't do more of in our own place, and then that, that's not our sector. That's just, you know, we're, we're, we're landlords. Um, we're, yeah, and, I, and we don't need that. We've got the engineering team, we've got the people, we've got the ideas. Um, and probably more importantly, we've got the biggest challenges in front of us that this, this sector is just so uniquely positioned to, to work into. Mm. Yeah. So I'm ambivalent on scale if it's for the right reason and the right outcome. Yeah. I would add another alternative. We've also got an amazing science here, and to not grow anything, but understand how to actually grow something and create tremendous value out of that, and then export that IP to other countries might also be a good opportunity. Uh, yeah. And that's probably well funded by MPI too. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, well, just, um, so just, there's something else on that around the, um, you know, we've got Sally Ann here who is with SFFF and I'm not saying go talk to her if you've got ideas, but actually um, there was about two, three years ago and a few of these initiatives were bubbling up, there was just cynicism, right? I get sick of people telling me why other people's ideas won't work. Mm -hmm. Focus on your own one. If you're right, well done. Yeah. If they're right, well done. And everyone wins, right? Yeah. Um, but I would just say that um, I, got, I could see that in parts of government as well. And you know, when I started talking about seaweed as, as part of a blue carbon kind of approach, and I'm, I'm not pushing hard on regulating that because I think there are other way, pathways into it, but I just don't want people to go, that won't work. I want us to help people make out where it's working. That's where SFFF is powerful on so many, so many fronts. And again, same advice I'd give to you all if you're going, I've got an idea and I think the regulations suck and aren't going to work. Well, come to us and we'll try and work it. Well, that's where SFFF does its best work, not when people throw in an application and hope. It's when you talk to them early about what you're trying to achieve and they can help direct and shape and, and do some of that stuff. Um, and, the, and the last point on that is it, it's natural for government to push towards collaboration and cooperation, but the things that are challenges uh, for CH4, that are challenges for accuracy, that there is going to be a hell of a lot of overlap, so let's not pay three times or four <coughs> times to answer transferable questions. Let's get that IP circulating, sharing, um, because the world doesn't need us to compete on this, it needs us to win on this. Thanks, Matt.